Before we start the episode this week, it would be impossible for us as film fanatics and Marvel obsessives to not comment on the sad passing of Chadwick Boseman at the young age of 43 from colorectal cancer. Chadwick Boseman was a shooting star. From all accounts, he was as good a person as he was an actor. You and I became big fans of his with 42, like I think most people. He played Jackie Robinson with a stoic and heroic strength in the quietest moments and in the biggest moments. He continued that acting uh, greatness with Vontae Mack in Draft Day to James Brown in Get On Up to Thurgood Marshall in Marshall. And of course, with his probably most iconic role and lasting role, T'Challa in Black Panther, a film that is culturally, historically, and cinematically significant, that has created a legacy that will last forever. To honor his memory, please consider a donation to the Colon Cancer Foundation, which can be found at coloncancerfoundation.org. And in his own words, I don't know what your future is, but if you are willing to take the harder way, the more complicated one, the one with more failures at first than successes, the one that's ultimately proven to have more victory, more glory, then you will not regret it. This is your time. Welcome to the How Could You podcast. I'm Lauren Tassi. And I'm Ryan Tassi. Thank you for joining us as we simply pass through history. Oh, that's so sweet. It was said by the villain of our story today. Oh, no! <laughs> you know, our, our film today, which will be another Spielberg PG movie with lighthearted family fare like Melton Faces and Nazi saluted monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to that within time. Uh, so those new to our podcast, uh, we're a married couple and we met at a movie theater and never really left. So this is the How Could You podcast where we ask all things How Could You in the world of film fans and a whole lot of pop culture references sprinkled in. Lauren Tassi, episode number two, the sophomore year. Are you feeling like a seasoned vet already? No. As referenced by how long it has taken us to do this intro, I certainly am not feeling like a seasoned vet. No, don't spoil the magic from behind the scenes. (laughs) I mean, this was the first take. Um, But I think the thing that I'm most happy about, besides getting to do this with you, is the response we've gotten from family and friends. Absolutely. Um, Truly, truly overwhelmed by the fact that people listened. I think that's the thing we're most shocked by. Um, And then just additionally, the nice things that you've sent us. It really means everything because this is something we wanted to do together and we really were doing as a creative expression of our love of film and the fact that you guys are tuning in and hopefully we'll continue to tune in just kind of means the world absolutely thank you to everybody but it's not without controversy we got controversy lauren tossi two trusted individuals calling you out on our first episode Yes. So our friend Doug, who we worked at Carmike with, uh, who also, he co-hosts the podcast Mary Not Friends, which was amazing. You should definitely check out. It's like sitting in a room with two people you want to be best friends with. Um, he is claiming that I saw it at Carmike, and I know I definitively did not. Can you I, help me out? I got your back on this one, okay? Because I know what he's talking about. We worked at the theater. Projectionist had bought a 35 millimeter copy of The Goonies. They would put it together sometimes and view it after hours. I know the time I saw it, it was put together, actually put together wrong, so we had a Tarantino-esque <laughs> Pulp Fiction version of it, where the boat scene's coming halfway through, and then we have the skeleton keys finishing up the movie. So I got your back on this one. Doug, a very trusted individual, but he had his facts a little off on this one, because you don't forget the first time seeing the Goonies in the movie theater. Yes, but the second one, this is a lot harder for me to refute. Yeah, I got nothing for you on this one. This comes from a very trusted individual in my life, my brother Dan. Um, Direct quote, she bleeping saw the Goonies. I know. (laughs) Listen, I can't remember where my car keys are, but I'm pretty sure I can remember if I saw the Goonies. But it is really hard to refute. And I just feel like I would remember that because my brother showed me a lot of great films as a youth that I have like fond memories of. I do not think he showed me the Goonies as a youth. But I can definitively say the film that we're going to talk about in this episode, I 100% saw as a youth and that he was the person who showed it to me. And our film this week is none other than Raiders of the Lost Ark. So now I am going to paint a scene for you, audience. So it was my birthday in July and we were looking for, you know, things to do because obviously, you know, current status of the world is kind of hard to go out (laughs) for a normal activity. So 
happily, Becky's drive-in has been showing a lot of great throwback features because, you know, there's not obviously the readily available new content out this summer. And when we saw that Raiders of the Lost Ark was going to be playing at the drive-in a few days before my birthday, we had to jump at the opportunity to go see it. I mean, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark on a big drive-in screen. And I was so excited because I love this film deeply, deeply love this film. And obviously, you know, it spawned this incredible series, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, at some point in the podcast episode. So we go up to the drive-in. We're socially distanced. We've got our popcorn. We've got way too many, like, candy options because I was pulling birthday, you know, so I was like, I get all the candies I want. And we sit down. And let me tell you, Raiders of the Lost Ark looks beautiful on a drive-in screen. The moon was big and full and hanging just above (laughs) at, like, the right corner of the screen. I mean, this was a magic evening and the film starts and Ryan just happens to like lean over to me and say Alfred Molina's in this and I thought oh okay well listen so like Alfred Molina was like not the household name when most of us would have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark so you probably just forgot that Alfred Molina opens up the film and I'm thinking truly nothing of that and then he says to me Alfred Molina's the bad guy in this right and I completely, I mean, it was like the exercise, like my head turned to the side and I glance over at you and he so casually says to me, oh, I've never seen this. <laughs> Ryan Tossi, how could you have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? I feel judged. <laughs> you should. It's my turn. The reckoning is coming. I, you know, sometimes it just falls through the cracks. Okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark does not just <laughs> fall through the cracks. Because, like, the Spielberg of it all alone. But how have... You have seen Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, speaking to why I had not seen it. It's a little bit... You know, I don't have that clear answer on that as most films. I mean, it's just one of those things of... you kind of go and it just you never end up picking it up but what's weird and unique about Raiders of the Lost Ark for me is like we we and I've been talking about some films upcoming that we might do and there's a movie in October that we're discussing for my for something I hadn't seen until much much older and the difference between that one I could kind of explain there's a very specific reason why I never had gone back to see that film whereas this it's a little bit different because there's nothing that should have kept me away from seeing it. Um, it's action. It's adventure. It was put out in a time that would have been right when I was prime for me to watch it. Um, I've seen two of the sequels. I have not seen Temple of Doom. <laughs> okay, that one I'm going to forget you on. <laughs> but I had picked up with Last Crusade. That was the first Indiana Jones film I had ever seen, uh, which I loved. Absolutely loved. Uh, Sean Connery was fantastic. It was my first introduction to Sean Connery. And absolutely loved that movie. And I saw Crystal Skull, which, you know, happened. But at what point did you think to yourself, like, okay, I've seen Last Crusade. This is obviously not origin (laughs) story. This is clearly a sequel. (laughs) How did you never go back and think like, hey, I love Last Crusade and I'll, I'll forgive you on Temple of Doom. I'm not going to like Kali Ma rip your heart out on this one because that one I can forgive. But how did you not go back at some point and watch Raiders? Well, see, here's the thing. When you're a pop culture junkie, when you like, you like to take in everything, sometimes when films are so iconic... They become so known that you see so many things that you start to feel like you know the film enough that it doesn't really warrant having to go back and see it. Um, I've seen so many clips of Raiders of the Lost Ark through the years, and I've seen so many different parodies of it. I've seen so many retrospectives of it that you start to put it together. Now, the one thing I will say, which... I really realized, you know, once we were watching actually Raiders of the Lost Ark that night was I couldn't have told you the difference between Temple of Doom and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, no. I didn't know which one came first. Okay. Uh, and I definitely would have, if you had asked me to tell you, give you a retelling of the movies, I probably could have given you a lot of both movies, but I don't know if I would have put them in the same order. Um, so I knew so much about both films, 
but I just never sat down and, and watched it. And I don't know. I'm sure my family watched them, but I have no recollection of that becoming this big franchise in my family um, for whatever reason. And maybe they'll that will be my controversy next week <laughs> where my family starts calling me out that, yes, you did see it. And we have, you know, we know exactly when, but I have no memory ever of actually sitting down and watching it and even watching it again last night when we sat down for a second time there's so much i don't didn't know i wouldn't have known that i i feel very confident in that um but you know if you wanted me to discuss indiana jones stunt spectacular oh yeah i've seen that Shout a out bunch disney of times world. to disney world well and in that then you would have seen two of the bigger like stunt piece three of the bigger stunt pieces of the film by seeing the stunt spectaculars yeah so why do i need to see it i saw the stunt spectacular i live the movie okay ouch offense <laughs> offense on just all accounts but i mean it, or if you're not from if you're listening you're not familiar in walt disney world in hollywood studios formerly mgm uh, no it's just MGM. I'm not calling it Hollywood Studios. <laughs> um, it, the Indiana Jones Sun Spectacular takes you through, um, you know, the opening scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. It takes you through the scene in Cairo. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, doesn't it end with the plane sequence? Yes. yes okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Like, back, you know, near, when they're ex- escaping the um, Well of Souls. Um, so, I mean, yes, you did see those scenes and I'm sure you've seen a lot of parodies particularly the opening oh yeah UHF Weird Al Yankovic's opening scene of that film best parody of all time of Raiders of the Lost Ark of maybe any film wow it only took the second episode for you to bring up your weird obsession with Weird Al hey I stand by it you can stand by it all you like I just would really like to talk about this classic film Raiders of the Lost Ark and I'll talk about UHF I would like to question how could you not have seen UHF Because I was raised well. Okay. It holds up. (laughs) I mean, I I would say probably the most damning of this is the fact that you saw Crystal Skull before you saw Raiders. But we'll even, like, put that aside. It might be why I didn't hate Crystal Skull as much as most people. (laughs) And just like that, our audience viewership completely evaporated into thin air. It's been fun, guys. (laughs) But uh, can you talk a little more about you know, why the film meant so much to you or do you remember your first time watching it? So I don't remember my first time watching it. I would say, you know, the film is so incredibly significant just from like a film history standpoint, of course. And because I have a soul, I saw it as a child. (laughs) Um, So, you know, 1981 Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there's so many amazing stories um, that go into the production of this. So if you don't know this, so George Lucas, there was just like such this incredible enclave, like conclave of like directors um, that were all really good buddies. Um, And, you know, probably the best friendship or the friendship goals that come out of this are, you know, Spielberg and Lucas's relationship. So Lucas had had an idea for this. He was really enchanted by like the serial films, um, you know, from the early 20th century, like your Buck Rogers, your Zorro, your Robin Hoods. Um, And he was really enchanted by this. So he wanted to come up with like his own version of doing that, but like in a modern way. So essentially like a callback to those B movies, but now done by directors who would do it better than those B movies that were kind of just like, churned out factory style from like the studio system and his original like treatment for this was Indiana Smith. Um, and it was the, I believe it was called the adventures of Indiana Smith. And he wanted to make this film and he had started working on this, uh, right after production wrapped on your favorite George Lucas film, American graffiti. Exactly. So yes. he, he comes off of that film and he decides that this is going to be the next project. And then he, you know, decides to take this other like little space opera on called star Wars and uh, I don't think I've ever seen that. You stop it. Of course you have seen Star Wars. Stop it. So, you know, he decides, so this kind of gets put on the shelf and it ends up in the hands of Steven Spielberg in a really interesting way. So George Lucas, when Star Wars was coming out, he escaped to Hawaii because he thought it was going to be such an immense failure. He didn't want to be in L.A., when this came out in tank. So he decides to go on vacay in Hawaii and, you know, invites his really good friend, Steven Spielberg. And while they're like hanging out poolside, now Indiana Smith changes hands to Steven Spielberg. And I just think I'm like, nothing that productive ever happens on any of my vacations. (laughs) So it's this really incredible moment um, that really changes. I think the trajectory of a lot of careers here and certainly the way in which the story gets told, you know, obviously, you know, the biggest change that gets made is um, Spielberg didn't like the name Indiana Smith. Um, the name Indiana Smith is actually inspired by George Lucas's dog, whose name was <laughs> Nevada Smith. Um, 
which obviously if you've seen The Last Crusade, you know why then that joke becomes really like funny um, later on in the in the film franchise. They named the dog Indian. Exactly. <laughs> so um, which that one you have seen, so you can draw that <laughs> reference. Um, you know, so he so Spielberg takes this on, and what's interesting is no film studio wanted to touch this. Uh, they knew that Spielberg went over budget, um, that he went over time. So it's interesting to think about any studio that like wouldn't want to work with Steven Spielberg. You know, the DNA here is interesting too because you have the screenplay itself is written by Lawrence Kasdan which if you're a Star Wars fan you know he wrote Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi Um, and then you also have Philip Kaufman who directed Invasion of the Body Snatchers who works on the story here as well Lawrence Kasdan also wrote um, The Force Awakens and he wrote Solo, a Star Wars story. And I know that one can be a little polarizing. We like it. Well, hey, do you- we're all positive Star Wars. Here. Yeah. This we love. This is all Star Wars positivity. Yeah, we take our Star Wars in whatever <laughs> form we get it, even in, you know, like weird. Solo's fun. Episode two. Yeah. Yeah. Solo's a good, fun movie. Yeah. And so it's, you know, and you can definitely see within. Um, you know, Raiders of the Lost are certainly where that like kind of DNA is and like why Lawrence Kasdan was like so apt to like write Star Wars films. But so it has such like an interesting production story that goes into it. And as I'm sure we'll talk today, it, it is just littered with iconic scene after yeah. iconic scene. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Even I, who had never seen the film prior, could have probably named you 10 of the scenes. Um, before we went into it, because, I mean, you just hit Grand Slam after Grand Slam with each one. I mean, I wrote down here as I was going through the movie, just, you know, the reveal of Indy, uh, you know, the running from the indigenous tribe, you know, where he's trying to get to Jock Lindsay, uh, the boulder, obviously. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like, you just take that opening like space. And right. are, it's already, it's like, it's one sequence, but kind of like five iconic scenes at the same time. And, the, the pr- production of how that happened, first off, Harrison Ford did most, if, if not all of his stunts for Raiders of the Lost Ark. The boulder scene was not supposed to be that long. It's just Spielberg liked how the boulder looked after production worked on it. <laughs> a giant boulder chasing Harrison yeah. Ford. You want to make sure you get your money's worth <laughs> exactly. out of that. Um, and then when Indiana Jones leaps onto Jock Lindsay's plane, um, the plane crashed. During one of the takes. Oh wow! Yeah, and 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 the boulder, if I'm not mistaken, I think Harrison Ford needs to stay away from airplanes. Yeah, really, I mean, honestly, <laughs> that is actually not a story I knew. I knew there were a lot of like interesting production things have happened, like injuries, like um, most of actually the entire cast and crew came down with amoebic dysentery when they were filming the scenes that are to pl- that take place in Cairo, with the exception of director Steven Spielberg because he only ate canned food from London when they were on location. <laughs> um, and and that goes into a scene I'm, I'm sure we're going to get to later, as oh, like yeah. we discuss. Um, <laughs> Even I know I know where we're going. You with know that. what scene I'm talking yeah. about. So what's really interesting is like you take that opening sequence and it's like he's doing all of his own stunts. He gets I mean at some point his foot got stuck under the boulder. You have all of these interesting things that happen just from that like opening thing. Our introduction to the character and myth and lore of Indiana Jones is so epic. It could almost be its own film. You know what? I, I, I that opening is. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I could talk about that for days. It is a perfect introduction to a character and to a film. It sets everything you want in that opening. You know, you have, you know, they don't show you right away with Indy there. They bring, you know, with where you're at. Um, you know, you set up everything all the way up to this iconic reveal of Indy, which is just amazing with the shadowing, with the score, all aspects of it. Truly such a stunning shot. And and fun fact is that actually that was shot in Hawaii. And, oh, the, and that mountain, what, you know, so it's just interesting. Like the DNA here is like so tied to Hawaii, but you're exactly right. Like I love that opening shot. It feels as epic as I think it's supposed to. Yeah, it gives you the entire tone of the film. Like Oh, completely. And I think the part that I really love about it is I think a different filmmaker opens that movie with him in the school first and introduces you to Indy as the professor as opposed to Indy as this adventure, you know, archaeologist. 
No, that you're so right there because it's like such an iconic way to do this of like, let's let's build him at like in his mythic proportions and then let's use the rest of the narrative to not not strip away, but to reveal like different layers of Indy, like where he might not be. You see him as this like grand epic hero in these like first like, you know, 10 minutes of the film. And now, OK, now you see him in school and now you see him kind of like bumbling yeah. through the rest of the adventure, not bumbling, but like, you know, times no, no, yeah, she makes yeah, mistakes yeah. like I, within I the rest of the adventure. You know, what I really liked, too, is the introduction to your villain of Bollock in that opening, too. Uh, we get him right off the bat. And in about a two minute scene, you know everything you need to know about him, um, you know, from who he is what his relationship with Indiana is and going forth, how he's going to play out throughout the film. No, you're so right. And that's, and also like you have in that character, a really interesting way of portraying villainy because obviously, so you know, your, your central villain here is we, obviously we have, uh, you know, the Nazi troops that are trying to uncover, you know, the Ark of the Covenant uh, to use. And I actually think this is, it'd be interesting to look at films that have used this idea of the Nazis were looking for supernatural forces because I feel like that's repeated a lot in like later films um, and graphic yeah. novels, uh, particularly the DC bombshell series. Like that's something <clears throat> that's brought up and, and you, so you have that villainy, but then you also have this character of Balak who's working for the Nazis, but they try and give these like really, really interesting dimensions and layers, almost like a, um, like a Batman Joker dynamic where like, you know, Indiana Jones is like, you know, the Batman versus you have Balak, who's like the Joker, who's like, look, we would be essentially the same person. We just had different ways of going about You this. know, I'm really glad you made that comparison because some a note that I had made to myself to talk about and thought we might, I'll jump ahead a little bit because it was going to be a little later, but as you're discussing that... I was actually, and anybody that's listening to our shows needs to know there's always spoilers. So I'm oh, assuming. All the spoilers. <laughs> all of them. If you didn't know before, <laughs> jump out now if you don't want to be, uh, you know, hit with spoilers of Indiana Jones. And, and if Rage you haven't Logic. seen it, how, how could, could you, you not, not have seen, seen it? it? <laughs> but uh, the thing that I made a note was I wish that that character doesn't get killed off. I wish Bollock doesn't get killed off. And I wish he plays more of like the Moriarty character to, you know, Indiana Jones throughout the films. I think that would have been. Oh, that's really interesting. That's such like an imagined universe where maybe he would have come up in later adventures. And I, all, you know, you think about then like the nature of the Last Crusade, how interesting that could have been yeah. with that character back in play. Yeah, absolutely. I just think, you know, and you just the hints of him. Now, again, it's hard. It's the first film. They don't know that that film's going to go on to make four, maybe five. Maybe uh, it's films. in production. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe yeah. we've got a fifth one coming. But you're exactly right because I think about that character, like the weight of that character coming back again is this kind of because if you think about it at base what indiana jones is doing can be kind of morally questionable like what right do you to have to take that artifact from that space that's not mm -hmm. your own so there's already something interesting about kind of the morality and the ethics of what he's doing but i think you kind of buy into the idea that indiana jones is doing it for the quote unquote right reasons of history <laughs> whereas Bullock is doing it for like financial gain yeah. and things that are a lot more lascivious but I completely agree with you. And it's also interesting, too, because, like, so there, so there are a few cuts of this film. Lucas actually had one of the last cuts of the film. Like, he got to come in and edit a portion of this because he was, like, deeply involved in the production. I, I didn't see Anakin Skywalker, uh, Hayden Christensen, <laughs> show up during the uh, opening of the arc. He's actually... So <laughs> floating around. <laughs> it's because you are looking closely. Anakin is actually the golden statue at the beginning. Oh, understandable. Yeah, yeah that's... Yeah, that's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but so Lucas had a cut of this. There was actually a lot more done with Balak and Marion's character. There was supposed to be... You were supposed to assume more of a mutual attraction that's there. Okay, that's um, cool. Uh, you know, I'm not cool, but I I can see that. I definitely see the marks of that in the uh, scene where they're drinking together, uh, That which I love, because uh, I, I think that really... What I love about this character of Balak as a villain is they give that character so many more layers uh, than... I mean, he's working with the Nazis, so you know he's evil. Yeah, of course, yeah. But there is a little bit more to him, and I think that's 
always something that I appeals to me of a great film is when you have your villain and you can kind of see these not relatable, but parts that you almost uh, appreciate about them. No, you're exactly right. Like there's something so important about a villain with dimension because yes, you do sometimes just need your big bads and, yeah. and you're oh, pure totally. yes. uh, like, yeah. like, you know, like kind of abject evil. Uh, but Balak is someone who can operate a little bit within that fringe. And you almost see like moments like you brought up like the drinking scene, which I didn't know this until recently was improvised. Oh, like wow. essentially her putting the knife in the clothing, it was a decision that was made by Karen Allen. Oh, um, nice. And and the kind of how that scene plays out. So it's interesting to think about that there were supposed to be scenes with more of this like mutual attraction and like understanding between them and just how that plays out. But I think that scene you're talking about, particularly with her, like I think she does some really interesting things to play off of his villainy, almost like yeah. to show him kind of more humanely. You know, one of the my favorite scenes with him in the movie is actually when they're sealing up uh, Marion and Indiana in the um Right after they steal the Ark back. Oh, and they're uh, in the Well of Souls. And he yeah. has to step away. And it's this great shot of him in the forefront realizing the, the weight of what he's doing and, you know, kind of questioning his own the own, own humanity. Now, I think that's more towards the Marion character than it is towards Indy, because obviously he tried to kill Indy at the beginning of the movie, <laughs> yeah. so I don't know if he has as much care there. But I, I like that that was included in the movie because I think that... That scene was just like, oh, okay, this isn't a purely evil person. I mean, he's evil, but not, you know, to the extent of some of the other characters in the movie. Well, and it's important, too, because I think there are a lot of incredible choices that Spielberg makes. I mean, listen, it feels, like, redundant and kind of, like, obvious to say, like, Spielberg's a brilliant director. (laughs) But it's also good, I think, to revel in reminding yourself of all the things that he does you know, in terms of those choices, again, like talking about minutia, but you brought up like such an important shot, like Balak, like being shown in like the foreground and the action happening behind. And I noticed like how many times throughout the film, like Spielberg puts something in front of a character that they have to like look through or that obscures them. And also like the use of shadow. There's such interesting things done with like duality. His of- use of shadow in this movie is out of this world. Uh, incredible. <laughs> like there's so many moments where, you know, you realize like the shadow and like kind of like the weighty importance of adventure, the way in which like we project ourselves into adventure. There's so many like interesting thematic things that he does with that. Like it particularly like, you know, when we're in spaces that are supposed to be like these, you know, like archeological sites and kind of like the projection of like, what is our space like within this world? Side question. Yes. Did the monkey get what it deserved? The monkey totally got what it deserved. The monkey, the monkey knew, <laughs> you know. But listen, and and oh my gosh, like I do, please understand, this is not like a mark towards animal cruelty by any oh, means. Right. And I only bring this up because um, during production, um, the film actually they had to go back in. So during the well of so- well of souls sequence, when the snakes are being dropped in, um, there happened to be a film that was being filmed next door. Do you know what film was being? filmed at the same time in Elstree Tree Studios at the same time as Bridges of the Lost Ark. I do not. It's The Shining. Really? Viv- wow. Vivian Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick's daughter, yeah. was really concerned by the treatment of the snakes and wow. complained. And they had to put new procedures. Now, not that the snakes were being treated poorly, but she didn't like the perception of like how they were being treated. So they had to put different things in place and like different codes. They actually, because like probably the story you will hear about this is that like Spielberg didn't feel like there were enough snakes, so he wanted like 10,000 snakes brought in. But actually, there's this other side story where Vivian Cooper was like, uh uh uh, I don't like what you're doing. Like, forget about what my dad's doing to Shelley Duvall, but these snakes. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) (laughs) But saw that being lined up. That's a whole nother conversation for another episode. <laughs> but, you know, so yeah, so she, she, she stepped in there. Um, but yes, to answer your question, the monkey got what it deserved. All right. <laughs> it's so adorable, but so evil at the same time. I'd like to talk about uh, Marion oh, here. Endlessly, I could talk about Marion. Yeah. What do you want to discuss with Marion? First, Marion, played by Karen Allen, who I just want to say I feel like should have had more iconic roles through the years. I think she's fantastic. Truly. Um, you know, She's got a good, you know, biography with her work. And, you know, I think most notably, you know, Animal House, 
um, you know, uh, Starman, which is the first time I was really introduced to her as Jenny. She was fantastic in that. Um, you know, later films, The Perfect Storm, um, November Christmas. <laughs> oh my God, we love November Christmas. <laughs> oh, if uh, podcast audience, if you want to cry your eyes out, just want to cry at Christmas. It will, watch, it'll yeah. break you into the mom uh, in the Sandlot. But you know what she's most notable for? What is that? Marianne. What? Uh, she plays Claire in a uh, holiday classic favorite, Scrooge. Gosh, we do love that movie so much. <laughs> not Christmas until Bill Murray's yelling at you at the end <laughs> to have a happy Christmas. Um, but no, Karen Allen kills it in this role. Oh, completely. She is just fantastic. I She plays this character tough, independent, strong, smart, spunky, and so real. I absolutely love it. Well, it's funny. So, like, I think about, like, growing up, and I think about, you know, you reflect on those, like, female, like, iconic roles. So, like, outside of, like, Disney princesses, it was, you know, Marion Ravenwood, Ripley, and Princess Leia. <laughs> like, the, that's, like, that's that's the trinity right there, folks, of, like, you're, you know, during that era, and you're right. You, you described her, all of the adjectives, everything you just said describes her perfectly. And then we get to the problems with the Marion. Oh gosh, fine. What? I love this character, and this is why this character. I this is going to be before before we started recording today. Lauren just looks at me and says, "I love this movie. You're not going to tear it apart, are you?" <laughs> Which I'm not sure what if it spoke about me. <laughs> I, here, I am very. I am precious about things that I love. Um, I am very protective of films that I love, almost like to an incredible fault. And I can get rather ornery when they are challenged. <laughs> One word to describe Lauren: passionate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, passionate and loyal. I am loyal to the films <laughs> I love. And I, I had a concern that you were going to bring something up. So go ahead and do it. Well, here's the thing: I had some problems with not the portrayal because I think Karen Allen does it amazing. I have some problems with the writing of the character. Fine, go. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that you know you built this really wonderfully strong character and then just a couple of things that you don't do real well with it. And I think they put her in a damsel in distress role a couple of times in this movie that I don't understand why. Like particularly when, like if you had to cite an example and you're like, Hey, Cairo this is scene is, is the biggest one with when the they're basket. with the baskets. Yeah. Um, having her pick up the frying pan to defend herself is yeah. probably a little problematic. The unnecessary shot of her change in that bollocks sees. Can I actually, Oh, I have a defense for that. Okay. I'm okay. willing to hear it. I have a defense. So now listen, I, you can, you can certainly back back and saying like the fact that she knew one of the ways to defend herself with, was with feminine wiles. You could say is a, is too much of a trope to be, justified or you could say it was a way of her like feeling kind of empowered in her femininity to know that she could distract Bob. I am just talking about the one shot. I'm going to explain to you why I think that shot because it's so important for us to see his male gaze looking upon her in this way in which because I mean there's obviously a lot of significance of this she's being put in this bridal white dress you know there is obviously like Balak has like particular intentions like with you know, what I would have to imagine would be like a completely doomed relationship or try it being with Mary, not even just because of her own interest, but also just because of the nature of how they met. But I think what's important about that scene of where you see her back and him like with his gaze upon her is what he's not seeing by being distracted by her femininity is her plotting to stick the knife within her wrapped up clothing to <laughs> later defend herself. So all I right, actually right. think that shot is very important for showing like how her wit and intellect and savviness in this moment is the thing that completely trumps like his male gaze upon her. All right, that's fair. I can go with that. So bring on another problem. I'm ready. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to bypass. I, I think the, pl- the plane scenes a li- isn't great either, but I can at least understand that one. My biggest issue, her relationship with Indy okay. is all over the place. And quite honestly, Indy's terrible to her. He's not great. <laughs> He's not good at all. First, which I think you're going to try to explain to me here. What is their relationship when they first were together? She makes a comment about being a kid. Okay. I know. Oh, I, oh, I knew it. Oh, okay. I'm going to try not to get rage filled here. But 
All right. So the line that he is referring to is like the, I was a child. Like Mm. this is something that I think can be like often joked about. Like what is the intention of that? Like what is their age difference supposed to be? What does she mean? She was a child when they met. It can seem really like horrifyingly inappropriate. What I think is trying to be said here is like the idea of like, she was a much more, innocent and unseasoned version of herself than the person we meet who's running a bar in Nepal and like drinking people under the table. Like, I think you're supposed to get like, she fell in love with him. They were in this very strange situation because he was like, you know, the mentee of her father. And she was at a time where this should have led to the, this is the person who's like my soulmate. We're going to get married and we're going to kind of do like the, you know, quote unquote, like traditional things that come after this. So I think like, Him saying, like, no, you knew because of having a father that, like, traipsed you around the world doing the exact same things I was going to do should have set you up for the fact that you this was not going to be a quote-unquote traditional lifestyle, like, traditions based on, like, 1930s standards. all right. So I think that's... but So Wendy's not a creep. He's just a jerk. Okay, he has a little mean to her. (laughs) I mean, he... He's a little mean. He's mean to her throughout the whole thing. He leaves her tied up at one point after she's been kidnapped. But... Okay, hold on. He doesn't warn her that Nazis are going to be showing up at her door. Okay, that's true. All right, I can't refute that. He falls that. asleep while she's kissing him. I mean, they've been through a lot, and there is this kind of a suggestion that and more happens. And most notably, he feels like he gets over her potential death real quick. <gasps> oh, 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 and Saul is just like, just move on, man. <laughs> Okay, first of all, first of all, I'm going to say occupational hazard of the dangers of his job. He probably has to get, like, conditioned to, like, dealing with death quickly. The professor at a university? I mean, it's an adventure. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm rather angry. But I do think if you want any sense of his strong connection with her and the importance of her in his life, it's his reaction when he finds her and you can see there is a tear in his eye when he is talking to her and asking very genuinely and very, and you can see there And this is a, a mark of Harrison Ford's performance. You can see he's terrified to get the answer. He asked her, are you hurt? Because, or did they hurt you? I forget exactly how he words it, but he says it in this way of like, he is so worried at the possibilities of what could have happened while he wasn't protecting her. And I think that is, and I also think like the nature of, their relationship is such that they know that it's again, it's not in that traditional format. And when he leaves her tied up, it's for her own benefit. Uh -uh, I'm going to refute that. And I'll explain why, because I would have agreed with you if we don't have the scene later where he's threatened to, to shoot the arc with the bazooka and trying to get, let her go. Oh, because Bollock calls him out on that bluff, which is a great scene. But he says, and I think really, I will say, this is one thing I actually love about how the indie characters read it is because he's a very flawed hero. There's a lot of issues with him. I mean, he's great. Don't get me wrong, but there are flaws to him and this being one of them. And I think that scene where he's not willing to blow up the arc shows he was worried more about the archeology, you know, dig and the arc than he was about necessarily saving her. But because it would have given them art. You know what? Actually, I'm not going to try and refute what you're saying. You are right. It's a weird moment. But I think he has justifications, but it's also kind of a hard moment because how, like, you could have let her go. But I think it would have given up that they were there and he needed to get the ark because otherwise the Nazis were going to have the ark. And I don't think you're trying to say that, that right, you don't fair. want it to happen. You generally want to keep Nazis away from You want to keep Nazis getting. away from the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> or you want to let them open it and let the disaster yeah. ensue. But oh he gosh. does, he has that great line of where he says, all I want is the girl. Like, how do you <laughs> not love that? All right, it's fair. It's fair. I mean, he does play, I think it plays a little Humphrey Bogart, Casablanca, with his relationship with, with Marion. I actually, I am going to completely agree. So, so often I feel like that the Han Solo role gets much more attributed as a, oh, it's like a Rick Blaine. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Indiana Jones is character that is a Rick Blaine. Yeah, like, I see. That I is agree so with you. much more of a Rick Blaine. No. And I know that was like a huge concern when they were casting Harrison Ford in the role is that it had to be agreed upon that there would be stark differences between Han Solo and Indiana Jones because he didn't want to get typecast into playing this one particular type of part. And I do think they're very successful in that quest because I don't see similarities Indiana, between the two yeah, characters. Indiana Jones is played by I think Harrison Ford. Do you want to go over his biography? Yes, I think he was in Witness. 
<laughs> Why are you just trying to anger our Star Wars fans in the audience? Like, I already said he's Han Solo. Stop it, you. He was also in Six Days, Seven Nights. Anyways. Um, <laughs> right. But, like, I, I think there, there are so many great, like, notes that he makes in his performance. It is, like, kind of that where, even if you're not familiar with Rick Blaine, we're referencing the film Casablanca. If you've not seen that, de- definitely see that film. Um, right. <laughs> I can't, can't overstate that enough. Um, but you're right. There's a lot of, like, similarities. Um, you know, particularly the traveling by map is very Casablanca. But, you know, I think definitely there's similarities between those characters and how they're portrayed. So, with that... Let's talk about iconic scenes. Now, we talked about the boulder. What oh, are yeah. some... You know, this was your first time seeing this. <laughs> At a drive-in, like, what were some of your favorite moments or scenes from the film? Oh, the, yeah, definitely. I I actually have two... Well, my favorite scene and my favorite shot are going to be two different here. Okay, so tell us favorite scene first. All right, favorite scene is going to be the bar scene. I, I love that bar scene. Uh, I think it sets up so much in that movie... Because it's obviously the introduction to Marion to start it. And then just the way you have so much tension, fear, excitement. It, it pretty much, again, like we were talking a little bit about the opening. And that's another thing with that film. It could almost be its own mini movie of knowing exactly what's happening. Because you bring in all of these aspects. You throw in some humor there with her drinking the whiskey and him asking for that, which I love. The lighting is amazing in that, oh, in that truly. and how they play the fire, which I know you discussed a little bit earlier. You know, you got the explosions going off, but it's not gratuitous explosions and violence, although this is a very violent movie. It is very violent. <laughs> but which I, I was will... like, even me, I'm like, what? Why was this movie so violent? <laughs> but, <laughs> but at that, and I will say this, like, we are not huge action movie right. people. I will say that. But this is my favorite kind of action film because I like action sequences that feel deliberate. But back to what you were saying about the scene within the bar, because I think this is actually yeah, a very good example of that. It's, it's story driven. It's not just, you know, and nothing against people that love action movies and those set pieces, obviously. But in this, when you have the action, it, it's all advanced in the story, not just stylized, which I think is great. So I love that scene uh, because you have this, this great back and forth. And it also, again, it, it adds on to the story because this is where, you know, I believe it's Tote. Is that? His name. To- 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 the, the they don't main, say it much. I no, think. No, they in don't. The movie. Main Nazi guy. Yeah, like, that's how I think I have Nazi him in my guy. Notes. Yeah. Um, he when he gets the um, the branding of the staff of Raw, you know, so it's it helps with the story there. It's just it, it adds a lot. I love that scene. I just love how he directed it. It was shot and choreographed. It was quite you know quite good. And then my favorite shot was is the shot of Indy digging oh, where they're digging for the come ark on now. and the How sun about in it? the background. Yes. Um it's I mean that that shot is I mean is awesome. And him putting on the fedora oh. is just so I mean it's it's about five seconds of the film, but it it again kind of sums up your movie. But that's what makes this movie so good is that there are these such a Iconic shots and iconic scene yeah. after iconic scene. Yeah, it's scene after scene. I I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question here yeah. because I feel like you're saying this. I feel like you would want to see these sequels really centered around Marion Ravenwood and not around Indiana Jones because <laughs> I feel like everything I do love you're that saying, character. Yes. And and I was serious with in saying that I think Karen Allen plays that. And I'd actually like to re go back and see Crystal Skull. And I know there's issues with that now understanding and appreciating that relationship a little bit more and seeing how that plays a little bit. Um, I want to see a solemn movie. Oh my God. <laughs> right. Like, and here's the thing, like to say that, that that's a supporting player is really to like downplay how incredibly vital he is, not only to like, and I think just the entire entertainment of this film, but like, I think to like Indy's success. Like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he uses children to guard Indy from being shot. I mean. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to say that is one of my favorite scenes because I love the fact that you, you enter what you think is kind of this like crowded bar cafe environment. Yeah. And what you don't immediately realize is that everyone there is in service to Bullock. And yeah, he just, he does, this film really surprised me on the second viewing how much I liked it. That makes me really happy to hear it because I won't lie, I was a little, and as you can tell by like our original, the thing you said earlier about like, please don't tear down this film, like that I had this worry of like, 
I was watching your reactions because I really, I was just like, I really need him to love this film. That's why I laughed when you had said that today about the don't tear this film down. Because I was like, you're fine. Don't worry. He is just, uh, every aspect of it, it is a, and I hate to use this because I can be a little hyperbolic, you know, is it's a perfect film. Like, it's it what really you is. want. I mean, it's got everything. It's got action, adventure, drama, humor. like Romance. Romance. Yeah, like, it hits all of that. It's got horror, you know? Oh, it really It's got does. Spielberg skeletons, <laughs> which should be a whole show on its own. We just should for, do a whole podcast episode on the skeletons <laughs> I meant to talk about there during, during the Goonies episode, and as I was watching this episode, I'm like, Spielberg and his skeletons are make me a little uneasy knowing what we know about poltergeists. And we just watched the show on Shudder about, you know, the poltergeists and the skeletons, the cursed films, cursed, yeah. cursed films and yeah. how they pretty much say in that, yeah, these are real skeletons. Now, they kind of played it off as, well, everybody uses them, which I'm like. That's a really weirdly I'm not comfortable sure, statement. I'm sure that's not anymore. I'm no, sure it was yeah. then. But I was <laughs> when I saw that last night, I was thinking that. But no, it. Play, so it ha- hits every, you know, thing that you want from it. You you were just inside this world and, and all of what he keeps kind of switching back and forth. And you have everything from these great scenes. When you were asking me about scenes, like, I was like, I could write a list of just great scenes. Like, I love the scene with, again, Tote, which we're not sure yeah. if we're pronouncing it right. But, you know, him coming in when he sees Marion and you think he's bringing out some weapon and it turns in just to a hanger. Oh, yeah, exactly. I love that. Yeah. Um, again, you're talking about these set, great set action, that whole scene of the chase. And, you know, none of it makes you get bored because you're you're right there in the action with them because he knows when to like to pull back and say like okay we're done with this chase sequence like he never lets it linger too long and again it all like it all serves the story and i think you know i think too like he tends to like for something that was like kind of born of wanting to make these serial films these serial adventure films like a thing again within like cinematic culture I think there's a lot of like disruption of like expectations because like you did, you did bring up, there are a few things with like Mary and like definitely to be discussed, but I think she is more of a disruptor of like, like, like damsel in distress trope than she is serving towards it. And I think like, the villains don't operate the exact way you think they're going to. Our hero doesn't operate the exact way you think he's going to. I feel like that we've been talking for a, good period of time now and we've barely even talked about our hero throughout the movie is really saying something to the film on a whole because it doesn't have to be completely on his shoulders but i mean yes you're right this film is obviously not the masterpiece that it is without harrison ford's performance the thing is is like i so i was really trying to think as i knew i was gonna ask you about like favorite sequences favorite shots and i know well our, our favorite shot is the same there's like no way not to just completely like yeah. love that shot but then additionally i just kept writing down i think as i was taking notes like every time indy smirks that is cinematic yeah. gold and because Spielberg knows how to frame it right. Harrison Ford knows how to play it correctly. And I think like every time there's a moment where Indy kind of is a little bit more lighthearted is so important to, you know, kind of the heart of this film. I think about three or four times in my notes, I wrote, this cast looks like they're having a blast. Yes. You know, and I don't know, but... And they all had amoebic dysentery, <laughs> so how much of a blast are they having? But they still seem like they're there having fun. There is this great... You're talking about that smirk. I love the scene when they're... Sala and Indy are going into the map room and they're trying to get them in. And, it, you know, they're in this, like, we're trying to hide away from the Nazis, trying to sneak into this, and Indy just looks over at Sala and smiles at him, and Sala just starts laughing. And I'm like, I don't know if that was in the script or not, but... All of them, it felt so natural. Even Karen Allen, like, when she was playing, like, you're talking about the smirks, and it it obviously comes back to Indy, you know, I think it's, yeah, I love it. I just love that they're just having a blast while they're in this movie. Well, because you have to feel, and we talked about this with the Goonies, like, you have to feel the authenticity of that these, that these people are like organically together, like that this is not something like, because I think that's where action films can fail or adventure films can fail is when they, it feels forced. Like, and again, when it follows tropes, when you're not feeling kind of like the genuine connections and it's a credit to how layered these characters are that you feel like as you discover them, as you watch them interact with each other, it feels like there's more there than just the role that they're supposed to play. Like there's more to Marion than the love interest. There's more to Indy than the hero. There's more to Sala than like, you know, the sidekick. There's more to each of them. There's more to the villain of Balak than just being villainous. I, I mean, everyone, well, 
except the Nazis. The Nazis are just Nazis. Like there's nothing more to them, but like, but everything else there's, there's a depth that I think is what makes this film so outstanding and, and, and the legacy that it is. Maybe the most iconic hat of all time. Oh yes, completely. Like there's, you're right because like, and that's, that's the thing to kind of point out because again, we've been talking so much and I think, you know, apropos like minutia, like making all, cause they're not my, in the end it isn't minutia. It's all of the things that add up to why this film is so iconic. I mean, you, know, you have, so this film was, it was a, nominated for, um, 11, 11 Academy Awards. Oh, wow. It won six of the you know, 11. I feel like the type of film that wouldn't be nominated today. Maybe that's just me, but... I think that's maybe you're just better at the Academy as of late, <laughs> but, like, it's... So, it won for Best Editing, Best Production Design, uh, Best Sound Editing, Best Sound, and Best Visual Effects. Yeah. It was nominated for Best Director, Best Picture, Best Cinematography, <laughs> Best Score, Best... Spe- uh, best Special effects, so the, and the categories change a lot uh, with the, the Academy over time, and also for best screenplay. And I mean, I like I feel like you can make justification as to why it could have won every single one of those categories, like you know, hand over fist. But like you're talking about like costume, like you realize like so much of like buying into kind of the mythos of indie comes down to that hat. Like that hat yeah. is. Well, you, yeah. you talked about the tilting of the hat. The tilting of the hat the is its own mythos. Hat, the silhouettes, like yes, it's there, completely, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, the, the score, which, you know, we barely touched upon, but I think a little guy by the name of John Williams. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Is <laughs> he known for anything? Oh, my gosh. that's He's known for everything. Right? He's he known is, for everything. If you know one composer's name from the cinematic <laughs> world, you probably know the name John Williams. And yeah, it is. I mean, and... It's just, yes, because it adds to the scale of everything that you're feeling at every different moment, like, within this film. Like, you need that score, I think, in some way. And, again, it's all how all the pieces kind of combine on this. And as we um, start to wrap some things up here, uh, you know, I think we've talked about this in last week's episode, and we'll talk about it again, is... Um, you know, I was going to ask about sequels. Goonies didn't have a sequel. This obviously does. Yes. Um, so my first question would be, do you think that there should be a, the fifth sequel? That's yes. in talks and coming out? Yes, completely. Okay, I all do. Right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just putting here's... a stamp on that. Okay, and I think that... I mean, it's been in production, like, limbo for a while <laughs> It really now. has been. Um, listen, I don't say that it's easy to... You know, certainly what happens with Crystal Skull can make anyone feel... Is that the reason you think that it should be a sequel? Yes, because I think you need to kind of... If you're going to make one last indie film, I think you need to make one last indie film that kind of takes the bad taste of Crystal Skull. Actually, That's how I feel about Die Hard right now, by the way. <laughs> you need, like, we one need, more yeah, Die Hard that film. Fifth terrible Die oh, Hard, we need rough. another one. I, I can see it. I, I see what you're saying. But Spielberg actually said the reason... Like, not the reason Last Crusade got made, but he said that Last Crusade was an apology for Temple of Doom. Oh, okay. So... I I think this film is going to be an apology so for Crystal Skull. So is Temple of Doom not as beloved? I mean, this is like a longer conversation yeah. for a different I know time. I know there's a lot there's of problems There's a lot of problems with, with Temple of Doom. Probably why we'll never talk about it on this show. Yeah. There's a lot Keep of problems. Keep it light, Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> light. He always said that to me. I never knew why. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of problems with Temple of Doom. I also think Temple of Doom, listen, we can joke around about the Caliban, like the heart-ripping sequence all we want, but it's just, it's not as good as Last Crusade, and it's certainly not as good as Raiders of the Lost Ark, and like, and then you have Crystal Skull, so like, I don't know, I think they go like, you know, one good, one bad, so maybe we'll just end on one good one and close out the franchise the uh, Yeah, way it I mean, I think you could still pull it off. I mean, yeah. Harrison Ford can command the screen, obviously. Her- when I watch Harrison Ford in interviews, I'm like, why? Well, wherever this guy's going, that's where I want to be. <laughs> like, he seems ready for <laughs> all just, adventures. Obviously, what they're going to have to do, though, I th- in my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, would be just you're going to have to turn change how the action sequences are. Like, we're not going to get the indie running through the jungles here. Like, you're going to need to play a little bit more for the script. Yeah, I think you're going to have to play to play to what his strengths are, uh, you know, at this particular moment in his career and like where Indy would feasibly be at that point in his life. And I, and I think you'll have something successful, but I mean, you know, so certainly this film has sequels and Listen, I think anytime you try and recast a Harrison Ford role, you're just asking for people to yell at you. Um, that's at you, Alden Ehrenreich. Um, but I love Alden Ehrenreich, so let, let, let that not be like... I mean, do we, okay, maybe we I mean, I mean, he did fine. I just, He's easy on the eyes. All right, all right. <laughs> so um, I will, you know, we'll start with you. Recasting. If, if we were recasting this, not that anyone would ever try and really recast this, but if we were recasting this, like, who would you put in some of those roles? 
Um, yeah. Um, I don't, do you want to go character by character? Yes, we'll character. Read yes, I like it. Okay, so, um, Dietrich, I don't know if you had anybody for him. I did He's the head of the Nazis. I had Army Hammer. There's not much to that role in the movie, but he's there a lot. Uh, so no, you're right. He is. You know, I feel like they're, not that I want to make this argument, but I feel like there's an argument can be made that um, Army Hammer would make a, a potentially a good Indiana Jones. Oh, gosh. Did I just jump ahead? Did you have... No, I didn't. Oh, no, 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 okay. no, 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 I didn't. But when you I mean, said no, that, I went... absolutely no, in my opinion. Uh, fair. Okay, but fine. Fine, fine, fine. <laughs> I'm not going to rail on Army Hammer he's right just now. Got, he's got, a, like, a really, like, chiseled jawline. Yeah, he's got... He looks love. like a Hollywood movie actor. I, we saw... Uh, what was the movie... Um, where he played the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger. <laughs> oh, movie. Um, I don't know if I want him as my. All right, so I did hero. not have a Dietrich. Okay, so we'll go right, with your next fine. one. Okay, who do you? Who, wait. So okay, I just I went deeper on this. I went yeah, deeper you cuts. really did. <laughs> I essentially have three characters that I picked, and I feel like I'm grossly unprepared right. for this. <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. Uh, so then I have. Um, do you have Tote? Yes. Tot. Tote. Yes. Tote. Tote. Uh, we tope. both agreed. We both looked at each other last night. Wait, there's. Toby, Toby Jones. Jones. Toby Jones. <laughs> if you know Toby Jones, so he is, uh, so he's in, you would know him from uh, potentially a lot of roles, but particularly like if you've seen Captain America, the first Avenger, he's, um, I mean, he's the head Nazi in that. So there's Right. Like, yeah. I mean, here's the poor guy. I mean, I'm he's, not trying to poor typecast him, but he basically plays the role in Captain America. Yeah, he really does. Um, yes. But yeah, I also thought about the kid that played Minkus back on Boy Meets World uh, back in the day, like. Thought he might be able to play that part. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing it. Right, and you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. Oh wow. Um, but but moving us. on, uh, Brody, uh, who I think is like a head schoolmaster. Yes, uh, I have him. I had Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, I totally see that. Yeah. I didn't have a Brody, but that's the Brody yeah, I want. Okay. Good I, Brody I, I choice. Care more, it this really movie does. means more to me than you. Okay, I don't think that at all. But <laughs> you're, it's because this movie means so much to me. It hurt me that's to fair. recast that's it. That's fair. Um, do you have Bollock? Yes. All right. I do have. No, Wait. I don't have a Bollock. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had Vincent Castle. 100% agree. Yeah. Uh, I was Vincent Castle, to... um, I believe Ocean's Eleven Part 2, right? Yeah, so Ocean's Eleven, 12. 12, sorry. He's been in a lot of things. Yes, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. Probably, I like, think that's the most he, notable yeah. and, one. And he's had a lot of performances, obviously, like within French cinema, so. Yeah, so I think he would be really good at that part um, because I think he has that, yeah, he can kind of play where, you know, appealing but also swarmy a little bit. I yeah, yeah, he's it, definitely, yeah, he definitely has that. I, uh, did you have an indie at all? Or? Okay, no, I haven't. Just, I haven't. Okay, <laughs> no, first of all, I, I'm, I have an indie and I have a Marion. Do you have a Sala? No, because no one else can play. Jonathan Rhys Davies would still Listen, play it now. No, as a no. huge fan of Sliders, the TV show, and Maximilian Aturo, I love Jonathan Rhys Davies. But I mean, we're recasting. I mean, he probably could play the part today. You can't, you can't <laughs> see my face. Well, yeah, because he has an age. You can't see my face, but my, like, shock and appall. And, and listen, this is probably a mark of, like, we talked about recasting, and you were obviously a lot more prepared for this segment than I was. <laughs> That's because but, I wasn't prepared last week, even though I came up with the segment. And I was like, I've got this entire thing recast, but yeah. I, no. I, was, I even wanted to cast the, um, the two agents <laughs> that hire Indy as... Ben Schwartz and uh, Bill Hader. But. So are Ben Schwartz and Bill Hader just going to make their <laughs> yeah, way into any is, film yeah. remake you're doing? Okay, so who would be your Sala if we were doing this in modern? Jeffrey Wright. Oh my gosh, 1,000%. Yeah. I, yeah, Jeffrey Wright and everything. Jeffrey, well, Jeffrey Wright should be in yeah. everything. <laughs> and it's going to be amazing as, you know, Detective Gordon in The Batman. Definitely, I can't wait He's going to be that. incredible. Can't wait that. Okay, I do have an Indiana Marion, I promise. Okay, I, I believe you. I believe okay. You. Okay, uh, Marion first, you go ahead. No, you go first. This was tough. We talked about this. We were having, you know, whether or not we could say multiple people yes. or not. Uh, but because I get yelled at all the time for having honorable mentions whenever we do lists. Because whenever you do a top 10 list, it's top 10 plus five honorable mentions. It feels like completely in disruption of like what the top 10 list is supposed to be. Anyways, continue. It's my list. I can do what I want. <laughs> um, Marion Crane, Felicity Jones. <gasps> Remarkable casting. Yeah, right? Remarkable casting. I only think I don't... I think she... I, I think she's a lead in most films and should be a lead in most yeah. films, but... Um, so she is playing, obviously, you know, 
the secondary character in this, but but I think we've obviously in talking about this, we've certainly like made right like where you could yeah. see him as. Co-leads. But I think she hits every mark with that. Uh, yeah, Felicity, Felicity Jones, Jones, Jones well. uh, Theory of Everything for people don't know and Rogue One. Rogue One. It was talked a lot of Star Wars today, yeah. so yeah, Rogue One is probably. <laughs> um, I do have a Marion. Who you got? Jesse Buckley. Oh. Uh, Yes. Ah, I knew you were going to like yes. that one. Uh, so Jesse Buckley, uh, she was in the film Wild Rose. Um, she's also in a film that's coming on Netflix. I think it just came out on Netflix called I Can't I'm Remember. I'm thinking about ending things. I'm thinking about I ending think, things. Yeah. Um, so I just, I see she's got that spark, that spunk. I could see yeah. her definitively yeah, in that. Yeah, she's so good. We don't have a lot that we've seen with her, but the things that we have. Yeah. Climbing up the list of actresses right oh, now. Oh, completely. She's yeah. so great and everything. Well, no, I definitely see that. Okay, you're indie. All right. I was down to two. I had one that was a little more outside the box and one that I think a little bit more fits it as we know the character. Okay. I went with that. I'm going Bradley Cooper. I'm trying to you're picture not <laughs> No, I don't see it. No, he I hits all the more. I don't he's, see he's it. He's got the ruggedness. He's got the handsomeness. You, you know, have to with sell the me on Bradley Cooper movies, he's got the um, the, the comedic and the and arrogance, the, yeah. and you know, no, I'm telling you, he could do it, and he can go in the shallow. In the shallow. No, 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 no. I won't sing on the podcast. We're not sing on the podcast. Um, we don't have that type of money for those rights. I really don't think Gaga is coming after us. I thought you were going to love this recasting. I almost wish I would given you my other one now. Okay. But no, no. I, I, I stand by it. I totally see him in it. I'm picturing it, and I'm not mad about it. It just took a second. It took a second. Listen, anytime you're recasting... Something that Harrison Ford has originated, it makes it really hard to find someone who hits all of those. Because Harrison Ford is... is you don't want I, one of the top, you know, Oscar-nominated actors these days? I do. Oh, okay. All right. I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You don't have to like this I'm idea. I'm warming to it. I'm warming to it. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of backlash on Bradley Cooper. I'm sure you won't. Um, there seems to be somewhat of a yeah, turn um, on him, but... Okay. All right. Um, I'm seeing it He's a little more. He's an more. Eagles fan. I mean, He's an Eagles fan. <laughs> E-A-G-L-E. All right. Um, so I would, okay. I was really torn and I whittled my indies down to three indies. You only get to pick one. No, that's so unfair. <laughs> it's my podcast. It's our podcast. <laughs> I just changed the rules for myself. Um, I had three and I had reasons for all three. I'm going to go with the one that I think is like probably my number one with a bullet, um, and that's Oscar Isaac. Yeah, I get that completely. Yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't like your brother. No, he already answer. basically played a Harrison Ford Han Solo character in the uh, sequels. So cool. We're gonna pause the podcast because <laughs> there's about to be some yelling, and I don't want to hurt anyone's ears. No, absolutely, listening. definitely get that. Um, he he hits all those marks. I totally see yeah. that. He's he's fantastic. All right, I do have to ask. Mm-hmm. Who was your other indie? I have to know. I can't not know. It's really outside the... Well, I think it's outside the box. What? Joseph Gordon-Levitt. That is way outside <laughs> the box. <laughs> I'm telling you, he has he has the charm. He's handsome. Mm-hmm. He No argument there. You know, he he's going to be able to play the character in a smart way, but also the flawed, so he's going to play both of those. I, I'm telling you, you know, maybe I'm just going by one scene in a Christopher Nolan movie, but, you know, I think he would Hold be on. more... Podcast family, I, I completely see it. <laughs> I actually completely 100% see that. I actually wish he had played Mutt Lang then in Crystal Skull. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think we all wish somebody well, had so played Mutt. No offense to Shia LaBeouf, I just don't think he was ready for the part. But I actually really completely agree with that. I think you've taken away my... Who are no, yours? I, Who are yours? Because obviously you gave me my second one just so you can set up for your second. That's not why I did that <laughs> at all. Um, Donald Glover. I completely see Donald Glover. And maybe this is me wanting to... Don't shake your head at me. This is me perhaps like... I, I really... I love Donald Glover and I think... I want to see him in like a major like temple he franchise. Been Spider-Man. He one hundred percent should have been Spider Man. There is like I mean, and with there no, is no I mean we both love Donald Glover. Oh so my this gosh, is yeah. not my my I 
I just see Donald Glover in this way of like, I completely see him within that professorial role. I completely see him being charming. And this may be an influence from Solo, a Star Wars story, because I think he made a wonderful, wonderful Lando. I think he's actually like the best part of that film. Even if you're someone who maybe feels like adverse to the Solo origin story, I think he's someone who works really well on that part. Like he did such a phenomenal job. And I was thinking about it last night, knowing we were talking about recasting. I just started seeing, they were just like reasons piling in my head where I'm like, I could see Donald Glover occupying that. I feel like our recasting, we have gotten very adversarial towards each other. (laughs) Um, So ending on an up note. So, you know, Ryan Tossie, you had not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, much to my shock and amusement because I knew we could make it into a podcast episode. So what are your final thoughts on this film? Do you feel like this is something that holds up? Do you think everyone should go and see it? Go. Yes. Fantastic answer. (laughs) Guys. You know what? A movie this iconic, a movie that is this good, doesn't need much more than that. I mean, it is worth all the hype. It's not a cult classic. It is a classic for a reason. A straight up classic. And, you know, your love for it, I totally get now. Um, you know, I can't, I do wish I had watched it more in depth as a kid. But on the same token, I'm kind of glad that I got, you know, to now see it, you know, this way. And, and see it with you, you know, for a film that means so much to you. That, you know, that you're passionate about. To now have the opportunity to see as an adult with you. I'm really happy that I got that opportunity. Because I also got to see it with different eyes. And it's not jaded by nostalgia. But rather seeing it through the eyes of 2020, Ryan. And saying, no, this is a just a really good movie. Well said. And for anyone out there who has not yet seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, how could you not have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Enjoy the Odyssey. (laughs) 